Good morning, church. If you're not a part of our church body here at Eagles Nest Church, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this online church that we're having today. Now, this past week, pastors have been scrambling, trying to figure out what's the best way to do online church. Some have said, well, you should just do it on your couch. Everybody else is at home on their couch, so do that too. I've got four kids now, so that one was ruled out. Uh, The other option was to have a classroom and do it in there. Some said to do it in your office, and some said just do it in the pulpit, and that's what I decided to go for. And because all of those options, there's no way to do this in a way that's not awkward, okay? It's going to be a little bit cringe, all right? So I think what would be best is if we just try to embrace the awkwardness, all right? Right now, I feel really awkward, and I'm sure watching probably is a little awkward too. So let's embrace the awkwardness. Let's try to engage our imaginations, all right? I will try to imagine that you are here in this building right now, not at home, on your couches, probably wearing your pajamas, okay? And you try to imagine that you're not doing that, that you're here, that you are together on the Lord's Day in this building, ready to worship and look to God's Word. All right, let's do that. Before we jump into our text, I got two quick reminders, okay? First off, all small groups, women's group, the men's group that was about to start, the men's Bible study, um, the seniors' nest group is not going to be meeting for the foreseeable future. We'll keep you updated on any changes that might relate to that. Second off, so, well, lots of things are shutting down. As I mentioned last week, they keep sending us the bills. So evidently, those parts, those departments that send out the bills stay open even through um, a pandemic like this. So if you're a part of Eagles Nest Church, all right, this is for if you are a, this is your church body, we would ask you to keep giving as the Lord calls you to. So you can send your tithes and your offerings either to the church's P.O. box or you can give online at the church's website. We just got that set up recently, so it's a convenient way to uh, to give. So that's it for announcements. Now, our text today is Psalm chapter 23. Now, in a moment, I'm going to read Psalm 23, but before I do that, uh, I would like to pray for us, and then I'll read the text. All right? So let's pray. Father, this is very new to us, very awkward to us, but still we thank you for the privilege and the ability to use technology in a time of crisis like this, to still try to meet as best we can, though we are not actually meeting, to continue trying to edify the church, to learn and to grow as a church body through your word. Father, we pray for those who are sick, and for those who are about to become sick. We ask, Lord, that you would comfort them, that you would care for them, and that you would draw them closer to you. And we ask that you would heal them even. We know that you can, but we ask that your will be done in all of this. Father, we ask that you would draw us as a church body closer together through this, that the absence that we feel for the next several weeks will make our hearts grow fonder for each other. And Father, we ask that we would be a light in a dark community, in a world that is feeling without hope. Help us to shine brightly, to make use of the situation as an opportunity to reach out to those who are in darkness. And we'll praise you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In Psalm 23, it reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, 
and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It was a rite of passage, where if they passed the test, they would be considered a man, a warrior, worthy of respect. But if they failed, well, then they would be humiliated. They would be considered a coward, a failure. Legend has it that when it was time for a boy to become a man, Cherokee Indian fathers would lead their son off into the deep, darkest of woods, and they would leave them on a stump to sit there overnight and tell them not to move. Their task was simple. Don't scream out, don't cry out, and do not move from that stump under any circumstances. It doesn't matter what comes at you. If there's a bear, you stay on the stump. If there's a wolf, you stay on the stump. Now, this was actually a very scary thing for them. They were not given any weapon, any kind of shelter, and they were told, stay there until the sun comes up. You do that, you're a man. If you don't, you're a coward. You are a weakling. Now, I'm 36 years old, okay? And I still get nervous walking down the hallway in my basement at night to turn on the light switch, all right? So there is absolutely no way that I would be able to do this, that I would pass this test. I don't care if you gave me a loaded shotgun and told me to do that out in the middle of the woods at night by myself, not happening. Now, imagine for a moment just how terrifying this would be, sitting there in the dark by yourself, with the howling wind, the rustling of leaves, the hooting owls, which is one of the most eerie sounds on the planet, and maybe even the growl of an animal. You're alone. you got nothing to comfort you. You're without aid. You're without a weapon to even defend yourself from a predator if it attacks. That's terrifying. And you know, church, Isn't this often a bit kind of how we can feel sometimes in life? Terrified. Freaked out. Wondering what's behind every corner. Wait, what's that shadow? What's happening? What's going on? How, you know, thinking there's stuff out to get us. Worrisome. Fearful. Full of anxiety. And anxiously hoping that light's dawn would break. Right now, it sort of feels like we're alone. In the night. We can't see what lies ahead of us. We have no idea what this virus will actually do to our society. In school, we read about things like this. Okay? We read about the Black Plague, the Spanish flu, and numerous other terrible viruses in history past. But we never imagined something like this could actually really happen to us. Not here, not now, not in the age of science. Surely science will be able to save us from the terrors of the night. We've never seen anything quite like this before in our time. 9-11 was scary. I remember 9-11. I remember sitting in class and looking at the TV wondering, what is going on? Okay, But as scary as 9-11 was, that was not a worldwide pandemic. This, what we are facing today, has every person on the planet wondering, if they know about it, wondering if it's going to hit, how they will survive it. Stores are closing. The stock market is tanking. Universities, they're sending kids home. They're saying, head home. We're going to figure out a way to do online class because it's too dangerous to be together right now. People are afraid of going near their neighbors. Even those who kept saying that the virus really wasn't that big of a deal, okay, you know what they're saying now? Maybe it is. They're starting to worry. And right now, we are expecting that the government's going to give a shelter-in-place order at any minute to say, you need to stay home. Lock your doors. Stay inside. Do not go out into public. And as we are painfully aware of, even most churches don't dare meet together. And instead, as we're doing this morning, are resorting to awkwardly doing online church. Okay? It's, it's the best of the worst case scenario. And so we're trying to make the, 
the best of the situation, which stinks because it still feels kind of like going swimming at a pool without any water. All right. That's what preaching to an empty room feels like. Okay. It's not a fun thing. We live in a time of uncertainty and fear. And we wonder, does anybody know where this thing's going to end? But as we know, God knows exactly where this thing's going to end. God didn't wake up and read the newspaper and say to himself, Houston, we got a problem. Okay, that didn't happen. God is the sovereign Lord of the entire universe. He is in total and complete control of every molecule, of of every single atom, and nothing happens in this universe without his divine stamp of approval. And that includes deadly viruses. God works everything according to the counsel of his will, Ephesians 1 tells us. And Colossians 1.17 tells us, he, referring to Christ, is before all things, and in him all All things hold together. There is no doubt that this God that we serve is powerful enough to wipe out this virus instantaneously without even breaking a sweat. So why doesn't he? Why would he ordain so much needless suffering? Because, as scriptures tell us, it's not needless. Not at all. And in fact, as Romans 8.28 tells us, it's working towards the good of God's children. In Psalm 23, we find what really kind of seems to be the Romans 8.28 of the Old Testament. All right? It tells us that the sovereign Lord of the universe isn't indifferent towards our suffering, towards our plight. He isn't unaware of it. And in fact, the sovereign Lord is also the good shepherd who intimately loves and cares for his sheep. Psalm 23 is probably the most well-known passage of Scripture in the entire Bible. People have it on their coffee cups. They hang it up on their walls. And it's very rare that you can make it through a funeral without hearing this passage read. And while this psalm is absolutely a comfort for the dying, It's actually more about living than it is about dying. This is a psalm that most scholars believe was written by an old King David, who is yet again on the run, but this time not from evil King Saul, but from his very own son Absalom, who's trying to kill him. Why? Because he wants his throne. He wants to take his father out and sit on the throne himself. And so we find an old David writing this song, as he looks back upon his life with the peaks and the valleys. And he concludes this, the Lord is my shepherd. It's a psalm about trusting God no matter what life may bring and realizing that he is the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, the psalmist says in verse 1. And because the Lord is his shepherd, the psalmist had hope in the midst of darkness. Do you want hope that overcomes the darkness? Then look with me this morning to this wonderful passage to see how we might have hope in the darkness. How can we have hope in the darkness? Well, one, we have hope in the darkness because our shepherd nourishes us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides still waters. He restores my soul. Well, the book of Psalms is often described, it often describes the Lord as being a mighty conqueror, as being a deliverer, a rock, a shield. Here it describes him as a shepherd. David is saying that the all-powerful God of the universe, he sheathed his sword to pick up the shepherd's staff in order to shepherd David. David's the guy who stole Uriah's wife Bathsheba, and then he killed the guy to try to cover it up. And God has decided to be his shepherd. 
This is the God who couldn't allow Moses to see his face because his holiness and glory would have struck him dead on the spot. And David says, the Lord is my shepherd. That is remarkable. That is unbelievable. The relationship between God and humanity, those he loves, his children, is like a shepherd to a sheep. The relationship between a shepherd and their sheep was a close and intimate relationship. Eastern shepherds would guard their sheep. They would lead them. They would feed them. They would bring them to water. They would rescue them when they strayed. They would assist in delivering the lambs when they were born. They loved them and they cared for them in every single way. They didn't raise the sheep to slaughter them for food. Okay, They raised them for their wool and for their milk. So it was a different kind of relationship. Did you know that shepherds knew their sheep by name? It is said that even when several shepherds would meet at a place of water, that they didn't have to worry about mixing up whose sheep was who. Okay? They didn't have to go around and brand them to figure out, oh, this is my sheep, this is your sheep. No, all they had to do when it was time to leave the watering hole was to yell out to their sheep, and the sheep would just follow because they knew their shepherd's voice. They wouldn't follow the voice of the other shepherds. And what a picture this is of our God and his love for his people. In John 10, 27, it says, this is Jesus talking, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus is the good shepherd who loves us and cares for us. How? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides still waters. He restores my soul. Does that mean we have everything we could ever want? That we'll never be lacking in any desire we have? Just get it all? Thankfully not. Because sometimes sheep, we sheep, we want really dumb things that would actually serve to harm us. Now, it's sort of been done to death by preachers talking about how stupid sheep actually are. So I'm not going to add too much to it here this morning. But it's true. Sheep are really dumb animals, and without their shepherd, in fact, they're going to die. They can't live without their shepherd. I didn't know this, but did you know that if you leave a flock in a field without a shepherd, they will sit there and they will eat all the grass until it's gone, and they won't move on to a field even if there's one next to them. They'll stay in that meadow, in that pasture, and they'll eat all the grass until there's nothing left to eat, and then they'll eat each other's excrement until they die. Okay, that's a really dumb animal. Now, thankfully, the good shepherd cares for us. He doesn't give us what we think we need. He gives us what he knows that we need. He gives us what is actually good for us because he cares for us. I don't want us to overthink what this text means by the food, the water, and the restoring restoring of the soul. So I'm just going to give us the short version, which is this. What is it that the good shepherd gives us? He gives us what we need. He gives us what nourishes our soul. Okay, Not just appeases our present appetites and desires and things that we want. And why does he do this? Because he's not just our shepherd. He is a good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives us what our souls need, which is spiritual nourishment, rest, and peace. Did you notice in verse 2 what the good shepherd does for us? It says that he makes us lie down. He makes us rest. Now, why is that important? Because a lot of the times, we're like little kids who skip nap time. We're like little kids who are up way past our bedtime, and we're running around rubbing our eyes and trying to say, oh, you know what? No, 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 I'm not tired. I'm okay. I don't need to go to sleep. I've got this. And we're just sitting there yawning away. But the truth is, We're actually exhausted. And we need a shepherd who will make us lie down to be nourished by the green pastures and the still waters so that our soul might be restored. I don't know about you, but this quarantine seems to be 
making a lot of us have to lie down. Many of us have been frantically running around with just the busyness of life, rubbing our eyes, yawning uncontrollably, refusing to recognize that we are spiritually running on empty. Maybe we've gotten out of spending time with the Lord every day like we should, spending time in prayer, spending time reading his word and being nourished by it. And you know, it wouldn't surprise me even in the slightest if this was a way that the good shepherd was forcing some of us, some of his sheep, to lie down and to rest and be nourished by God through his word. And that is exactly how the Lord nourishes us. It's through his word. Look, we have no idea how long this quarantine will be. But I'd like to challenge us to not waste it. To not spend all of our time binge-watching Netflix or watching the extended version of The Lord of the Rings. Because even if this thing goes like a month, you're not going to have time to get through The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit on the extended editions. Okay? But secondly, don't waste this time because... This is such an opportunity for us to nourish our souls in a unique way that most people never get. Don't refuse to lie down. Don't wander away from the green pastures and the still waters that the good shepherd is leading you to. We have hope in the darkness because our shepherd nourishes us. But secondly, because our shepherd protects us. Last part of verse 3 says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In the last part of verse 3, it says, He leads me in paths of righteousness. That's not talking about obeying the Ten Commandments or living a godly life. He's saying the good shepherd leads his sheep down the right path. Okay, The path that they need to go down. Did you know that sometimes if a sheep will continually wander away from the shepherd, that just keeps wandering off, it refuses to lie down, that the shepherd will resort to breaking that sheep's legs? Now, why does he do that? Well, it's not because he's annoyed with the sheep or wants to harm the sheep. It's because he is forcing the sheep to lie down and stop wandering off because he wants to keep that sheep on the right path. Suffering always results in one of two things. For those who truly aren't God's children, it pushes them away from God. They may be in a position where life is happy and grand and they're not having too many problems. Okay? They're not in the, in the valley of the shadow of death yet. It's not dark around them, and they think, yeah, I'm cool with God. I have no problems with God. This is great. But then suffering comes, and they run from God. They flee from him. But for those who are God's children, it does the opposite. It draws them closer to him in a way unlike any other. Did you know that when a shepherd was forced to break a sheep's legs, he wouldn't just leave them to lie there on the ground until their legs would heal? In fact, what the shepherd would do is he would pick this little lamb up. He'd place it on on his shoulders and he would walk it around on his shoulders until its little legs were healed. And the remarkable thing about it is that this would create a deep and unbreakable bond between the shepherd and the sheep. So much so that the sheep would not only never wander off again, but it would spend the rest of its life trying to be as close to the shepherd as it possibly could. Is anyone else wondering if perhaps this virus might be our good shepherd's way of breaking some of our legs so we would stop wandering off? So that we would spend the rest of our days trying to be as close to the shepherd as we can. We have a shepherd who always leads us down the right paths. A shepherd who protects us, not from pain or hardship, but from things that would ultimately destroy our souls. Our shepherd never leads us down the wrong paths, but only down the right paths. Okay, And that includes paths that are sometimes painful, dark, scary, and dangerous and difficult. 
Well, we often think of verse 4 as being about physical death. It actually includes so much more than that. What verse 4 is saying, it's saying that even though I walk through the valley of the darkest of shadows, which includes sickness, pain, suffering, and yes, even death, my shepherd is there protecting me and comforting me. And so I will fear no evil. When the Cherokee boys made it through the night and they saw the sun begin to rise in the horizon, they were extremely relieved and excited to have made it and passed the test. But do you know what they discovered when the sun rose? They discovered that they were never alone. They were never in any real danger. And why? Because when the darkness had passed, they looked up to see behind them their father in a tree stand, bow in hand, smiling down upon them. Even though the night is dark and the wind is blowing around us and we hear predators stalking nearby, we fear no evil. For our good shepherd is with us and he is armed with a rod and a staff to protect us and comfort us. This doesn't promise to protect us from death itself, but it does promise to protect us from the power of death, which is why Paul could say, he said, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what we face or how dark it seems, we have hope because our shepherd is with us and he protects us and he will bring us through it safely to his fold. And what's the guarantee of this? For his namesake. That's what the psalmist says. He does this for his namesake. And if you know anything about the God of the Bible, his name and his reputation matters a lot to him. That's the biggest guarantee we could ever ask for. We have hope in the darkness because, one, our shepherd nourishes us. Two, our shepherd protects us. But three, because our shepherd is good to us. In verse 5, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In these verses, David is talking about how the Lord cares for us. Not, how, not just simply how the Lord will, will one day care for us in heaven, but how the Lord cares for us right now in the midst of life's darkness, in the presence of my enemies, which would do us harm, is what David is talking about. He's saying that even when we are in the darkest of nights, God is there with us, with his rod and staff ready to protect us. And he is there pouring out blessings upon us. And these aren't just tiny blessings. These are big, big blessings blessings. In fact, the table has been prepared. The banquet table has been laid out before us. Our head has been anointed with oil and he fills our cup, not just three-fourths full, but overflowing. It's kind of like having somebody over for prime rib instead of McDonald's hamburgers, all right? That's the kind of God we serve. He rolls out the red carpet for us. David's point is this. Our God is a very Loving and very generous God. He is a God who turns our troubles into triumph. Not just someday in heaven, but right now, while we are in our trials. How is that? Because when God is for us, who can be against us? If God is at our side, then what can they do to us? For to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so the psalmist 
looks around at the darkness of his situation, and he remembers that his shepherd guards his soul, and the dawn is surely coming. In Romans 8, verse 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? And we might insert virus. Verse 37. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you hear the message of the psalmist? Nothing can separate you from the good shepherd. Not even a deadly virus that might kill us or our loved ones can separate us from the good shepherd. Because at the end of even that dark path awaits us the arms of our Savior who stands ready to shower us with all of his love and blessings for all of eternity. No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you realize how good God has been to us? Do you realize how merciful he has been? The psalmist did, which is why he could say, as we sung last week, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Who is your shepherd? We all have one. So who is yours? For the psalmist, his shepherd was Jesus. He didn't know the name of Jesus yet, but it was surely Jesus which is why he had comfort and not fear even when walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Why would that bring him comfort? Why should that bring us comfort? Because Christ doesn't lead us into uncharted territory. Only Christ was the one who faced the darkness for us and defeated it for us when we could not. He's already gone there for us. Jesus is the only one who has traveled through the valley of the shadow of death and came out the other side victorious. And he did this, not so that we, he could send us through it alone with a map, which would have been nice enough, but no, to walk through it with us and to protect us, to be with us, to guide us and to comfort us. Christ, on the other hand, he faced it alone. He went through the valley of the shadow of death by himself, and he overcame it for us so that we might overcome death with him at our side. There is no other shepherd who can or even would do that for us. Not Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, or David, who were all shepherds. Okay, None of them, though, were the good shepherd. In John 10, verse 11, verses 11 through 15, Jesus says this. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Who is your shepherd? You can't shepherd yourself. And if it's not Jesus, whoever that shepherd is you're looking to is going to fail you, and they're going to leave you wanting and alone. But not only that, as David pointed out in verse 1, this shepherd is also the sovereign Lord. Which means that if he isn't your shepherd, then someday you will stand before him as your judge. 
He will be our judge. Even when this virus is gone, make no mistake, it's just postponing the inevitable. Something else is going to get us. All right? It's going to happen. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then comes the judgment. We will stand before the sovereign Lord of the universe. And you can either be judged by the good shepherd who laid down his life for you, okay, or you can be judged by the sovereign and holy and righteous God who will, as scriptures say, by no means spare the guilty. Don't waste this moment. One preacher I listened to this week had something that really struck, that really stuck out to me. I liked it. Here's what he said. He says, when it comes to understanding things like the coronavirus, all natural disasters are a thunderclap of divine mercy in the midst of coming judgment, calling all people everywhere to repent. Don't waste this moment. If Jesus is your good shepherd, Lie down, rest, and be nourished in him, in his word. Do not fear. And if he's not your shepherd, turn to him. Not tomorrow, not the next day, not next week, next month, or next year, but today, now. James says this, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Time is short. Do not delay. Turn to the Good Shepherd and trust in Him. Lord, I pray that you would teach us as a church, as a people, to number our days, that we might gain a heart of wisdom. Help us to see your life, to see our life as the vapor that it is, which is but for a moment, and then it vanishes. We ask, Lord, that you would comfort us, that you would draw us near to you, that you would make us lie down if we are wandering. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to live a victorious life in the hope of the gospel. Help us not to cower in fear, but to remember that you are with us and that not only will you sustain us, but that you will give us abundantly all that we need to face the trials of this world, and to face it saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing benediction comes from Colossians 3, verse 15, which says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Fear not, church, and hope in the Lord.